Good morning. Catherine, can you turn mine up just a little bit? Um, we have all the things going on today because it is that time of year. So you have been warned. Uh, this is Christ the King Sunday. We are going to celebrate communion. Uh, Granger is again bailing out the UCC folks in uh, Murfreesboro. So we have some recorded music for that. Susan is our musician from Greater Lake of Egypt today. So uh, she'll be providing that. And Gala's filling in as our liturgist. Now, a couple notes because things have changed. The blood drive for tomorrow has been canceled because the Red Cross does not have enough staff. Um, so hopefully at some other point over the winter, I, I mean, I know they're, they're going to call us again because they call us a lot, um, but uh, mark your calendars and look for that. Prayer group is going to meet this week on Tuesday at Jean's house. So it's going to be a Thanksgiving dinner. And if you want to show up, just show up, talk to Jean if you need to know how to get there, that sort of thing. Um, I'm out of the office this week on vacation. I'll be back in the pulpit next Sunday, but this is my take a rest before the marathon of Advent and Christmas begins week. Um, next week is our week at the soup kitchen. So please talk to Cindy Burroughs over here. Yes. Cindy is pleading for folks to come to the soup kitchen the week after Thanksgiving. So please do keep that in mind. Next week starts Advent. We've started decorating already. Um, and so there will be a couple things that are changing in our worship for the season of Advent. One, we're going to be singing an awful lot. Bring your singing lungs, bring your singing voices. We didn't get to do this last year. We're going to make up for it this year. Um, so we've moved back to three congregational hymns, and we've added some other pieces of Christmas music for you guys to sing during the season as well. So if you can't make it through on five Advent and Christmas carols a week, I really can't help you, but that's what you're going to get. Um, of course, we'll have the Advent wreath out. Um, in terms of the bulletin that's going out to folks, the one that goes mailed out electronically will still contain the music or there'll be a separate attachment for the music, but we've put the hymnals back out in the sanctuary. So um, feel free to use the hymnals starting, well, you can start whenever you want to, but next week you'll need to um, because I'm gonna save us some trees by not printing all of them for everybody here in the room. Um, Where we are right now heading into Advent and Christmas is that Longest Night will be in person and probably in person only. Um, it's really hard to do that level of emotional content over Zoom. That will be uh, the 21st um, at 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary. Then Christmas Eve right now, the intention is for Christmas Eve in person and on Zoom here in the sanctuary, candlelight communion looking like it sort of looked several years ago, um, assuming we don't get a spike. Please do be watching your email for anything we have to pivot to in cases of public health um, in that sense. Right now, that's the plan. Nothing has held up planning wise for the last year and a half. So um, those sorts of things. Um, Right now, Bob Ames is in surgery uh, this morning. So Marna is with him. The kids are with her. So that sort of thing. So we'll be holding Bob in prayer throughout the rest of the day um, until we hear what's, what's the result of that. Hopefully, he will be back home um, at the start of this week to recuperate. Um, that is the slate of sort of announcements that we have at the moment. Do we have anything else or anything I've missed? Bill? Okay. Bill is reminding us that this is a short week for Thanksgiving. And so leaf orders, if you're gonna order from leaf, they need to be in by tonight. 
and delivery will be Tuesday, not Thursday. Um, next week, we are going to ask for your help in the next couple of weeks in decorating the tree with Chris Mons. So be ready to get up and move probably during the offering to help us decorate and move us fully into the season. Are there other announcements this morning, Tom? Yeah, uh, this is kind of a personal announcement. You know, most of all of you know Amy are singing in the church, and she's been doing a uh, Sunday concert, Sunday afternoon concert at 5 Eastern. And today she's doing one of the concerts at 5 Eastern on uh, Facebook or, or uh, YouTube, and uh, not on Zoom. It doesn't work with Zoom. So. But she's doing it with her, her dance band, the uh, Cyber Moments. Okay. Uh, So five Eastern, four Central, find Amy Kachark on Facebook or YouTube or Pester Tom, because I'm sure he can get you a link. Are there others? Let's worship God. Lift up your heads, O oh, you gates, be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. Amen. Let's join together in our hymn of praise, number 121, O little town of Bethlehem.
This, in essence, is the message we heard from Christ and are passing on to you. God is light, pure light. There's not a trace of darkness in him. If we claim that we experience a shared life with him and continue to stumble around in the dark, we're obviously lying through our teeth. We're not living what we claim. But if we walk in the light, God himself being the light, we also experience a shared life with one another as the sacrificed blood of Jesus, God's son, purges all of our son, all of our sin, I'm sorry. Righteous God, you have crowned Jesus Christ as Lord of all. We confess that we have not bowed before him and are slow to acknowledge his rule. We, we give, give allegiance, allegiance to, to the powers, powers of, of this world and, and fail to be governed by justice and love. love. In your mercy, forgive us. Raise, Raise us, us to acclaim, acclaim him as ruler of all, all that we may be loyal ambassadors, obeying the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the message we have heard from God and proclaim to you that God is light and in God there is no darkness at all. If we walk in the light as God is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Thanks, Thanks be to, to God. God. Amen. Amen. be seated. This time of year, it's easy for us to get caught up in stuff and thankfulness and everything. Uh, we had a long discussion in Sunday school this morning. One of the questions was about where would we choose to shine the light of God in a land that lives in the darkness of despair? I think for us, it's important to remember that while we may have an answer for that, other folks have a lot of different answers. We talked about how the folks in Malawi are generally really happy people, and they wonder why we're so stressed out. Um, and they might shine the light of God on us stressed out Americans. Um, this is a good time for us to be thinking of others and not just of us, and to be thinking about what would make a great gift for others as God has given us a great gift. So as we go into the Advent season and the Christmas season, the joy gift, um, alternative giving, all those sorts of things. Be thinking about a gift that might give others new life. We are in the prophet Isaiah today. We have jumped again, um, and we're with Isaiah. The first lesson is not familiar. The second lesson is familiar, um, and several of you are just going to want to sing the latter part of the second lesson, so hold it in at least until we get there. Isaiah says, I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his place from the, his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. See, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. Now, if people say to you, consult the ghosts and the familiar spirits that chirp and mutter, should not a people consult their gods, the dead, on behalf of the living for teaching and instruction? Surely those who speak like this will have no dawn. They will pass through the land, greatly distressed and hungry. When they are hungry, they will be enraged and will curse their king and their gods. They will turn their faces upward or they will look to the earth, but will only see distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you. 
After that bursting in the song, we may have some bursting in the song by the end of the scripture passage. But there will be no gloom for those who were in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea and beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, let's be honest. How many of you started hearing Handel's Messiah at least a little bit at the end of that? Yeah. Yeah. It's, we were kind of trapped. This is the ultimate Advent passage. We're reading it a week early, and it feels a little odd, but just a little bit because we're almost there. And we as Christians almost always read this passage as pointing forward, pointing forward to Christ. But by the time we read it at Advent, we read it as though it's already happened. We are remembering the gift of this child, even as we prepare for it again. We are remembering prophetic voices and prophetic visions. And this is where prophecy gets really, really weird. I don't know how many of you noticed, but almost all of this passage is in past tense. Isaiah says to God, you have done, you have done, you have broken. All of this stuff, almost all of it, is in past tense when Isaiah is talking about it, not just when we think about it. And so there's this challenge with prophetic stuff in general is like, do we trap it just when Isaiah said it and hold it in amber and it only speaks to people then? Or is the power of scriptural prophecy such that it speaks in all times and places in some way timeless? Well, I don't think we would still be reading Isaiah every Advent if we felt it was just trapped in amber in approximately 740 BC. So then here's the question. If this is both a backwards looking and a forward looking passage, how do we hear it today? Not just with our knee jerk reflex reaction of, yay, it's Advent, let's play Handel's Messiah. This is all about Jesus. But as people who in 1819 
20 months have not lived as we would like to live. And frankly, know a little bit about despair over this time period. I think for us this year, Christ the King ends a year, it starts a year, it does all of these things. It is an opportune time for us to imagine this passage being read directly to us now without us knowing the answer. What does it mean for us in December almost of 2021 to say that the people who lived in darkness, on them light has shined? How have we seen the light of God shining? Intermittently, in full-on glow, or kind of like a cigarette in the middle of the night on a Navy ship, visible for two miles, but really not much help if you're trying to read the paper. How is it that we have seen the light of God in our despair, in our struggles with the past year or longer, in our frustrations? Because the statement is not that it's always been good and God makes it better. The statement is they lived in a land of deep darkness and on them light has shined. How have we seen the light of God in the last 19 months, 20 months, whatever it's been, way too long. I would also remind you that we're griping about less than two years, and we have lots of biblical examples of 40 plus years and 400 years. People in the good old days really were tougher than us, weren't they? Um, what does it mean for us to celebrate? Isaiah says, using present tense, that the people are rejoicing, they do rejoice as people at harvest, as people dividing plunder, as people in those moments when the hard part is over. In, in agriculture, in farming, there is often great anxiety until the harvest. All the work has happened, all the money has been paid out, all of the fields have been planted and they've started to grow, but until you harvest, you have no idea what you have. Until you harvest, it's not real and available for sale, for consumption. It's just out there. We could still have a rain, a wind, a fire, a hailstorm. It's just out there. You don't divide plunder until the battle is over. In the words of Kenny Rogers, you got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, but you don't count your blessing till the dealing's done. You didn't think I could pull that off, did you? These are all promises that the hard time is over. People are rejoicing as though the hard time, the uncertain time, the dangerous time is done. And Isaiah says, that's how people are already doing this. I don't think we're there yet, but what, do we even remember how to celebrate as though the hard time was done? Or are we back to kind of muted, kind of, well, if this is what it is, I guess we got to do it this way. There is a conversation in here. I'm trying not to get it caught up in the handle version, which is still running through my head. Um, about what's going to come next, that the boots and the garments that were rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. And we can read that as, as a basic cleanup statement, that the battle is over and there is not a need for these clothes and they are soiled and so they must be consumed and destroyed, or we could read it paralleling the idea of beating swords into plowshares, 
that we are past the point where garments set aside for combat are needed. And then we have, then we have the child. We have the child, right? For unto us a son is born. It's happening. And Isaiah probably means King Hezekiah. We have taken that to mean Jesus. It's kind of foundational to our faith. I don't think it's a bad decision in light of our faith. Modern Jews take this to looking forward to a messianic age, an age of the Messiah. And so here we sit, and I want to ask you the question. If we don't make this about the Jesus we know, what does it mean to think about the wonderful counselor? the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace, as one who is here and yet we're still waiting for. But that is happening right now. Not just past tense, not just approximately 2,021 years ago, but is happening now. How would that transform our world? I think we have to take this passage seriously, not as past tense, but as current and vibrant and living promises of God about the people of God and about how God intends to do things. You guys know that I can get a little animated and a little bit wound up. It happens. It actually fits this passage really well because when Isaiah says how this is going to happen, Isaiah closes this passage with the zeal of the Lord of hosts is going to do this. Man, you thought it was bad when the preacher got excited. What's going to happen when God gets excited? That's essentially what Isaiah is saying and something that I think we let slide off of the tail end of this passage. All of this stuff, whether in the 8th century BC, whether it's in the 1st century, whether it's in the 21st century, God is excited and passionate and invested in being a part of all of this. This is not humdrum God stuff. Can you have humdrum God stuff? If you can, this is not it. God is serious and active and hopeful and excited and animated, and energetic. God is being a zealot for God's people. In other words, God is, ex is as excited about us singing Handel's Messiah as we often are about singing Handel's Messiah. Now imagine that for a moment. Imagine a God excited about what's happening with us. So excited, in fact, that it's just going to be God's excitement that makes it all happen. That is what we're talking about in Isaiah 8 and 9. We're talking about both, yes, a fundamental transformation, a word that needs to happen to people who live in a land of deep darkness, to people who live in despair, people who have seen in this case, the northern kingdom overrun by Assyria. By people who have lost jobs, who have lost their mortgage and their home. By people who have not seen their loved ones, who have lost loved ones to death without being able to see them and without being able to celebrate their life and their resurrection. By people who are unsure if the bad times are over yet or not. That is who this passage is for. And if that's not us, if that's not a piece of the worldwide story over the last two years, I don't know what is. We have lived in lands of deep darkness. 
They haven't all looked the same. Some of them are scarier with different shadows at night than others. But we are also the people on whom that light has shined. And God is deeply invested in this transformation. And it is not just a past tense. It is not just 8th century, and it is not just 1st century. The power of God, the zeal of the Lord of hosts that is doing this, is also a 21st century promise. So as we head into Advent, as you hear Handel's Messiah, as you lose the game for hearing Little Drummer Boy sometime over the next couple weeks, as you pack and as you decorate, as you gather with family and friends, as you do all of these celebrations, look for the places that you have seen the light shine in the darkness. Look for the ways in which you have seen God's excitement spill over into our own lives. And ask the question of yourself, of your church, of your neighbors. What does it look like to worship the eternal Father, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the mighty God, and the wonderful Counselor? Not as though we know the answer, but as though our curiosity is rising to match God's zeal in doing this. To God alone be the glory this day and forevermore. Amen. All right, now for something completely different. Catherine, Gala, come on front. Catherine has been in confirmation classes at Harrisburg and has met with the session and presented her statement of faith to the session. And so today she is joining the church as a reaffirmation and a profession of faith. So Gayla, will you please present her to the congregation? Yes. We have Sister Catherine. She presented her So Catherine, we now we rejoice that you now desire to declare your faith and to share with us in our common ministry. In baptism, you were joined to Christ and made a member of his body. And in the community of the people of God, you have learned that God's purpose for you and all creation. You've been nurtured at the table of our Lord and called to witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built upon the foundation of apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ himself as the cornerstone. Now, you need to answer these questions affirmatively. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? Do you? Who is your Lord and Savior? Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? Will you? Will you devote yourself to the church's teaching and fellowship, the breaking of bread and the prayers? Will you? Now, friends, I'm going to invite you to join with us as we say together the words of the Apostles' Creed, affirming our faith in that historic fashion. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. The third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, will you pray with me? Gracious God, by water and the Spirit, you have claimed us as your own, cleansing us from sin and giving us new life. You made us members of your body, the church, calling us to be your servants in the world. Renew in Catherine the covenant you made in her baptism. Continue the good work you've begun in her. Send her forth by the power of your spirit to love and serve you with joy and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right, now Gail and I get to lay hands on you, preferably in a gentle way.
O Lord, uphold Catherine by your Holy Spirit. Daily increase in her your gifts of grace, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, now and forevermore. Catherine, remember your baptism and be thankful and know that the Holy Spirit is at work within you. It's a zealous poor people. Catherine, by professing your faith publicly, you have expressed your intention to grow in the covenant God made with you in your baptism. May the spirit continue to strengthen and sustain you in the worship and mission of the church. Amen. Hallelujah. And now we should exchange the words of peace. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Friends, the newest member of First Presbyterian Church of Marion. She was baptized here. She has been confirmed here. She is running the tech here, in case you were wondering about that, stepping into newer and greater roles in the church. Um, she has offered herself to God this day. Now we each give our offerings to God. Friends, the offering plate is up here. Let us give and receive our morning offering. may be seated. Friends, as we have seen, we bring more than our offerings of money and time to God. We bring the offerings of our whole lives, of our time together, of our time apart, of our gifts, our talents, and everything. We bring our hopes and our dreams, our fears. We bring the fruit of our labors before God. Friends, what is it that we need to be adding to our prayer list today? Do we have others? Will you pray with me? God, we come to you this day seeing some of the fruit of our labors as your people born out, hearing them lifted up in our prayers, thanksgiving, and thanks, the generosity of others, wonder and awe at the promise of something that seemed unimaginable even just a week before. We come to you this day giving thanks for successful surgeries and asking for comfort for those who are unsure about their health and their recovery and asking that you would be with them in that. We come to you this day praying for those who are traveling to see loved ones, for those who are struggling with this holiday, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. 
we come praying. We come just praying, God, for so many of our friends and neighbors, both here and around the world, who do not have what they need to live. And we mean that in terms of food and shelter and clothing and clean water. And we mean that very truthfully and really in the form of hope. We ask for this passage in Isaiah to be made true again this day, that those who live in lands of deep darkness, on them light might shine. God, we come to you this day because you have come to us. We have seen your zeal and your excitement at work in the world, in the prophets of the Old Testament, in the incarnation of Jesus Christ, and in the people who have borne the name of Christ for the last 2,000 years. May we be filled with your zeal for peace and righteousness and justice as we go out into the world this day and every day. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. And now we come to the table. The table is a really funny entity in the life of the church because it is supposed to be a joyful feast. And yet many of our churches fence the table. You need to be a member of that church. You need to believe a certain way. Our understanding is that this is not our table. This is not a table that belongs just at 1200 South Carbon. This is not just a Presbyterian or a Calvinist or a Reformed table. This is Christ's table. And all those who Christ welcomes are certainly welcome here. So as we come to this table on Christ the King, that is a good reminder of what it means to have Christ as Lord of all, is that we don't get to set the requirements and the entry standards for this feast because it is Christ's feast. Know that you are always welcome at Christ's table. Will you pray with me? God, our history with you is long. Even when we move beyond our personal history, or especially when we move beyond our personal history, our history with you is long. You have known us when we were being knit together in our mother's wombs. You have called us by name in the waters of baptism. You have waited with eagerness for us to affirm our faith in you out loud in front of other people. You have given your body, the church, that we might help one another on that journey to say that you are the one who holds our hope. You are the light that shines in the darkness, that the darkness has not and cannot and will not overcome. So we come to you this day, we remember lots of stories. We remember manna in the wilderness. We remember the deliverance of people. We remember numerous stories of improbable children, Isaac and Ishmael, Samuel, the Christ child. We come to see you at work in the everyday and in the things that have to happen. And we come to see you transform them. We come for company in our wilderness, for guidance in the form of a cloud or a pillar. We come because we have seen it and we long to see it and feel it and experience it once again, the presence of God. We ask this day that you would restore in us our hope, that you would shine your light on us and drive away despair, and that you would prepare us to wait again as your people for the coming of the child. We might be prepared, perhaps better this year than ever before, for the coming of a child who is known as a wonderful counselor, mighty God, and Prince of Peace. 
We ask this day that your spirit fall upon these gifts of bread and cup, that they may be for us your body and your blood given for us, and that they may strengthen us. We ask this with the words that you have given us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead me is not temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Christ the King encapsulates the entire life of Christ from prediction to birth to betrayal and death, and then onward to resurrection. So this day, we are reminded that during the last week of his life, Christ gathered with his disciples in the upper room to give thanks and to celebrate the Passover, a time at which God's saving power had been revealed to the world. And after the meal, he took the bread, and having given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. And in the same way, after the meal, he took the cup, having given thanks, he poured it out. Less zeal than the poor here. And he said, this cup represents the new covenant, which is sealed in my blood, which is shed for the forgiveness of sins. All of you drink of it. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's saving death until he comes. Friends, the table is set. The feast is ready. All that is missing is the people of God. Cindy and Gala, I believe, are going to serve today. Um, so I'll let them come forward. Friends, the bread of life broken for us. Never thought I'd see the day when the crinkling of plastic wrappers would be something we looked forward to in church. It's always something we were shushed for when I was growing up. We do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Friends, this is the cup of salvation poured out for us and for the forgiveness of sin.
Will you pray with me? God, we come to you this day. Having been fed, we come to you this day having been welcomed. May we go out into the world and not forget what it is to be welcomed at your table, fed at your table, to be in your presence. And as we go out, may we hear your words to Abraham be words to us. We are blessed that we may be a blessing to the world. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I did manage to skip one thing. We're just going to keep on skipping it. So we are now to our hymn of consecration, number 233, the day of resurrection. Let us sing together. I was being serious when I warned you at the beginning that we were going to do all the things today. We professed faith and saw the reaffirmation of baptismal vows. We celebrated at Christ's table. We went from Christmas to Easter in our hymnody, and we heard the words of the Old Testament prophet talk about all the ways in which God has been and is at work in the world. If I can give you one thing to take with you this week and into the Advent season, it would be the seventh verse of the ninth chapter of Isaiah. It would not be Handel's bit. It would be that God is zealous for God's work in the world and that we are that work. God loves us. God knows us. God calls us by name. God will not let us go. And until we get it, God is going to work very hard in a very animated, very excited, very zealous way to get us to get it. So friends, go and know that if nobody else is zealous about you, the Lord God, the maker of heaven and earth, is zealous about you. And go and carry that out into the world. Friends, go and may the love and zeal of the Lord our God the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with us and abide with us this day and forevermore. Amen.